Hello, and welcome to the Mentor Dino YouTube channel. I'm your host, Caitlin Rosier. I am an architect and founder of Mentor Dino. Each week, I interview amazing professionals in and around the architecture, engineering, and construction industry to help foster learning, growth, and inspiration in others. Thank you all to our current subscribers, and if you're new, we'd love to have you join our community. So hit subscribe, it really does help others be able to discover this resource. So let's dive in. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome everyone back to the Mentor Dino podcast. I would like to welcome Mandy Freeland, architect, educator, and firm owner out in Bakersfield, California. Thank you, Mandy, so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for having me, Caitlin. I'm happy to be here. So to get things kicked off, um, let's start out with um, an introduction on yourself, um, your education experience, and how you got to where you are today. All right. So I'm Mandy Freeland. I am a licensed architect in California. Um, if you want a little background on my education, I have an associate's degree in architecture from our local community college, Bakersfield College. Um, happens to be where I'm also teaching as an adjunct instructor right now. So uh, circling back, like the circle of life, um, <laughs> getting back to where I started and chose to get my bachelor's degree instead of transferring into another architecture program getting my bachelor's degree in a different area of study. So I have my bachelor's in communications and public relations. And I had intended on getting a master's degree in architecture and urban planning, but changed my mind when <laughs> I was just kind of done with school after doing two different majors. Um, it took a long time to, to finish both of those. And I just wanted to not go to school for a little bit. So I stopped school at that point. In California, you don't have to have an accredited degree to get your license. And so I thought, fantastic, because I don't want one <laughs> myself. I was just kind of done. So that's my education path. Um, when I was in college, I worked for a company that was a pure design built company. It was a, a general contractor owned company that had in-house architecture and then acquired civil engineering and we worked together as a team so the architects didn't get work from any other contractors and the contractors didn't get work from any other architects and we worked on every project except for hospital and public schools in five different states so it was a uh, quick climb of the ladder to leadership in that company and a uh, great experience um, on the architecture side, learning about construction. So I learned, so I tell people and I tell my students too, that I learned how to do architecture from the contractor's point of view. And it helps a lot in what we do as architects in creating the plans and instructions for them to build what we design. So um, if there's, I mean, just throwing this out there, if there's something I can recommend <laughs> to young people in the industry, it's to maybe spend some time with contractors, working with them, asking questions, if you can get in on a job site and just, just ask some questions, how you can do your job better, um, ask them how they build things because it might help you make your uh, plans better. Um, so uh, let's see, got married, had two children, a boy and a girl, and then um, sort of took like the longer path, kind of like the mom path of having the babies and then doing the testing. And then I got my license nine years ago. Wow, I had to do that math. <laughs> nine years ago. And, I can't even keep uh, track of what year it is now. So <laughs> I, know. I know, 2024, quick math. Okay. Yep. Um, nine years ago. And uh, I was working at a firm that it just wasn't the right fit for me. So six weeks after I got my license, I went out on my own and started my own firm. So the firm that I started was the first women-owned firm in Bakersfield, California. And at the time, I think there may have been three or four licensed women architects in our county. Um, so that's about out of 100 licensed were women. So since that time, I think right now we're about seven. <laughs> so now we're 7% growing slowly. So within that nine years, we've, we've doubled our numbers, mm -hmm. but still very small number of women architects. And how was, there's so many questions I have. 
Um, how was going through the exams after having kids? How was that process? Or do you have any recommendations for anybody who still has some exams or hasn't taken any yet, but have started and have a very young family? So I started, like, honestly, I thought I was going to start after my first child and I had them three years apart. So I thought, okay, after the first one, um, I had the time accumulated. Um, and, and during that time, California was changing what was required to get a license. So before AXP, it was called IDP. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started my licensure process, California did not require IDP. So when I started, we didn't have to do IDP, which is now called AXP. Um, so it was, it was like get started. And then a couple months later, then they required IDP in California also had a sub, another supplemental IDP called CIDP because they didn't think that proving your work to NCARB was enough. They wanted you to also prove it to them, which was like essays of oh, geez. <laughs> approving the work that you did in your job. So, and then I guess a few years after that, it was, uh, they removed the CIDP requirement and just kept with the IDP requirement. But that was also the time when NCARB was changing their exam from 3.0 to, I don't know, 4.0, just -hmm. changing. It was just so much changing. And that was during the time that I was having the babies too. And I just, it was just a little bit too much because I had maternity leave and I just had, and I was like, okay, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't work. And, um, do the tests and have the babies. And my second pregnancy was a little harder than the first one, which is sometimes the case. Mm -hmm. Um, I was sick almost the whole time. And so I said, you know, I'm not going to put the pressure on myself. Um, I'm just going to wait. So I didn't, I waited until after having my second to actually just dig into the exams when my head was straight and when I could do it. But I was working full time. My children were in daycare. Uh, they were going to two different daycares. So one was at a, a Christian preschool and one was at an in-home daycare. So two different drop-offs, two different pickups, <laughs> mm-hmm. two different schedules, my full-time schedule, my husband's full-time work schedule. It was a mess. And then having the testing, like studying for the exams was just another, it was really hard. And I mean, if I can, it's it's going to be really hard, but you just have to persist. I wanted to circle back on getting your license in the state of California. I am not licensed in California. So I know there's one additional exam. I've heard stories that it's more you go in and you're talking through drawings and not a straight exam. Can you kind of tell us what that exam's like? Yeah, I can. So it's called the California Supplemental Exam. We shortcut it with CSE, that's what we call it. Um, It used to be an oral exam, which is probably a lot more intimidating than it is now. But when I got my license in 2015, that was the first year they made it computer-based. So before 2015, it was still oral. And oral was done in front of a bunch of other architects asking you questions and grilling you. That's what I heard it from, from an employee that I worked with that had been licensed in California prior to 2014. So that all makes sense. <laughs> and I I hear that it was very subjective, that it was um it was just a little bit different. So doing it computer based makes it a little more objective and I'm happy they made the change. Also happy I didn't have to go through it myself. The exam is so California has uh, a few more regulations and um than other states. We are a little stricter. We have our own code, which is just adopted from uh, various other codes. But we uh, have uh, seismic design is is important, kind of like how Florida does when design. We mm-hmm. we uh, it seismic design is is pretty important here. We don't want our buildings to fall. Um, we actually have a lot more earthquakes lately than we've kind of ever had before. Uh, they're more common, and uh, buildings aren't falling. So. It's it's happy for us. We're not in the news for buildings falling because <laughs> yep. we're doing things a little bit more safely now. Um, so a lot of it has to do with the things that make California more unique. So that's what the exam is is more based on. Um, 
they do test you on things like all of the different regulations and agencies in California, like a coastal, the coastal uh, agency. So any, you know, construction or buildings done in the coastal areas and how the wind and the storms and stuff impact them. Um, the uh, different state agencies. So they want you to understand the processes and the agencies that they have in place in California. Um, it's a very big state. Uh, we have a lot of people here. Um, there's a lot of different conditions. We have mountains, beaches, deserts. We kind of have like everything all in one state. So uh, our, and and in addition to that, we have our own uh, Cal Green, our, our little energy code that is uh, for energy efficiency. So we want to make sure that people know that too. But the exam itself, they usually present a project. It's usually project-based. Uh, as part of the exam. So in addition to learning what the agencies are and what the purpose of the agencies are, you also go through a public project, which is publicly funded um, and usually something like a fire station or a police station or something like that. And you just work through how uh, you accommodate for uh, egress and what you have to accommodate that's, that's different than just a standard public building. Is it one that's like... I'm thinking of it more like a QC. Is it something that's currently being built or was built, but then they don't give you like the life safety drawings and the code drawings and you've got to fill that in? Is that kind of how that is? Um, I don't know. You know <laughs> I don't remember it that clearly. Honestly, it was more, let me see. It was more like, what do you, um, these are places that are intended to be places for um, people to go to in an emergency. So uh -huh. um, the safety factors are different. They're higher. So the building needs to stand more than just withstanding a fire or a seismic event. They have to withstand, they have to, they have to actually like shelter the people in the case of an emergency. So uh -huh. it's more, it is, it is like fire and life safety, but it's extra. Yeah. On top of that. But yeah. It's, Got it's it. a real project. They do use real projects. Nice. Interesting. I don't think and, I'll ever get licensed in California, but it's always <laughs> nice to know. Um, licensed architects actually write the questions, too. Going into the project types in general, what types of projects do you work on? I know you mentioned you started your own firm, so I don't know if anything you were doing prior you do now currently, or what do you work on? Yeah, so I work on commercial projects, industrial projects, uh, public school projects. Um, in California, it's a little bit tough to uh, get into the network of doing public school projects. There's It's qualifications-based, not fee-based in California. So that means that you have to qualify. Um, and then the fees are generally about the same for all of the architects and engineers that provide services for public projects. So they want to hire the most qualified, not necessarily the cheapest, which I think is fantastic. Although Agreed. one of the, I know, one of the qualifications is to have your firm have five years of experience doing public projects to be able to qualify to do public projects. And having a new firm, it's kind of hard. It's like chicken and egg circumstance yeah. where you don't have the five years of experience because you're a new firm, but you can't get the five years of experience because you don't have the five years. Anyway, um, so when I started my firm. The firm that I was at prior to starting the firm was doing uh, school projects, and I made really good contacts with the people that worked there. And when I started my firm, the local high school district, which is the second largest in California, um, opened the door to myself and other smaller architects, and they created a contract for miscellaneous small projects, so not very big projects, but sort of less risk on their side. Mm -hmm. for the smaller firms to do and to get the to start earning the five years of experience so they created a way for me and several others to get our foot in the door so if it wasn't for that i don't think i would still be able to qualify yeah because you almost need that anyway and that's almost it's very similar to how hospital systems will start mm -hmm. testing out firms is you typically have to get some of the smaller work to build up that trust in knowing the people locally. So mm -hmm. very similar. Since it sounds like they set the fee percentage, or is that yeah, just negotiated I'm... afterwards? 
It's um, in your statement of qualifications, which is a nice big heavy packet of everything about you and your firm, you have to include how you come up with your fee. And mm -hmm. in that, the standard practice in California, which is not like state regulated or anything like that, it's just the, you know, a common practice is that the new construction projects are a particular percentage and then modernizations or alterations are a percentage higher than what the new construction is. So several years ago, they stopped using it, but several, several years ago, the state of California published a table of if it's, if the, if the construction estimate is within this dollar range and this dollar range, then your percentage, your fee is this. So they sort of dictated it before, but then they stopped dictating it and they let firms um, do their own fee. So part of the qualification is that you provide that, how you determine your fee. Um, mm -hmm. But pretty much you just provide, they tell you what work they want you to do, and then you provide a proposal and then they accept it or they negotiate gotcha. if they want. Yeah, it was, I was more curious with the, it's always a conversation of when you're going after projects and firms just lowballing each other to get the work or there's not as much in their pipeline. So they just need to win the project, to keep their staff employed and not worried about profit because architects are so bad with money. And then you wonder why contractors can make so much more and the, their profit margins are so much different. So I was just I was curious if them setting it helped with that at least in terms of us lowballing ourselves but if that was delegated and saying here's what your fee is and it's still really low it's kind it of the, it's the unspoken rule so we all mm -hmm. know what the fee is and so we all base our i mean we don't want to go lower than that because pretty much that's the rule right yeah so we go by it so we yeah and and it does pay better but public projects tend to pay better anyway so um in california i'm not sure how it is in other states but california public projects have to pay like the labor for the contractors at a prevailing wage which is definitely mm -hmm. higher than what the standard wages for laborers so um we want to make sure that the job is done well not necessarily cheap yeah exactly um and so are you by yourself in your firm how many people are you, do you have so i am by myself but i hire 1099 contractors um to assist me when my workload is heavy and um the ones that i've hired so far are also licensed architects from other states which is really beneficial to me um I started doing this a few years ago during the pandemic when um, several people that I knew in my network were laid off, um, newly licensed, but also laid off. And so they decided to go out on their own and in going out on their own, getting their own business started, maybe they weren't taught how to run a business, how to do the financial stuff, how to plan for things, all of the state regulations that you have to do as a business owner, different than, you know, just getting your license. It's a completely different world being a business owner. Mm -hmm. So um, we agreed to work together. They would provide um, production work for me and I could teach them how to run their business. It wasn't like I didn't, they didn't pay me or anything to mentor them. It was just a mentorship kind of situation. Yeah. But um, <laughs> so it worked, it worked out really well. And then I was able to give them, you know, some steady income while they got on their feet. But the state of California also has a rule about hiring um, people to not be construed or misinterpreted as employees. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of rules to follow. Some other states also do that, too. But they um, you can't you have to follow all of these guidelines so that you they wouldn't be interpreted as an employee. So they have to work for other people. They have to have their own business. They like you can't pay for their computer, their software, anything like that. You like it has to work like a consultant. Okay. And then how do you find 1099 professionals or how are 10 people looking to be a 1099 find people that will hire them? So that's networking. So our industry is really word of mouth and it's really who you know, right? Mm -hmm. Um the way that I found them was being a part of a few online communities on Facebook. One of them was Young Architect with Michael Rasika. 
So he had, um, a, he's got a great amount of um, people who participated in his ARE boot camp and uh, attended his young architect conference conferences. Um, mm -hmm. So I met them through there. That's one of them I hired through um, through meeting her through him. And then a few others I met on Entree Architects on Facebook, on the Entree Architects community. And that is a community for entrepreneur architects. So it's just kind of a, we're all in this together. We're all here to help each yep. other and to teach each other kind of community. So it's just kind of saying, putting it out there that, hey, this is what I do with my business. And if anyone's interested, you know, I can, I could use a little help. Um, one of the people that I hired um, came at a really great time for me. I broke my leg two years ago pretty oh, no. badly. <laughs> and I um, hired her and she took care of my production work while I recovered from breaking my leg. And it was a really, really awful break. Um, I broke my femur when I was wakeboarding <laughs> and it was, it twisted the bone and it snapped Ugh. and like, it was just a mess and it took a long time to recover, but I was actually grateful that I kind of had this set up for her to step in and help me with that. So I think it's fantastic. And I like working in this method and being a new firm owner or just kind of a smaller firm owner, it's really hard to take that step into hiring employees and mm -hmm. having, it's hard. So as a business owner, it's hard to make sure that you have consistent money coming in. And then the, because it's just in this industry, it's just really not consistent. It's, it's inconsistent though. Getting the projects is inconsistent and getting the money in for the projects are inconsistent. You have to really have a good system and good clients to make it consistent. So that to me is a little scary hiring staff because that means I have to make sure that I have that consistency down. And so when I'm ready to take that step, it'll be when I'm at that consistency level. Yeah. Cause it can be, you're stressed now and you need help now, but you may not need help in six months. Yeah. And that'd be really hard. I would find it really hard to bring somebody on and then have to let them go but you're yeah. trying to build. So yeah. what's the best advice you've given the professional that's starting on their own and doing 1099 for you? Um, let's see. We, well, one of the questions that comes up that isn't taught while you're working as, a, as an employee in firms is how to get the work. Like no one ever teaches you how to get the work because that's the secret sauce of the firm mm -hmm. owners right? That's their, that's how, that's their magic. That's, that's, you know, how they do it. And sometimes maybe more traditionally minded firm owners are not open to teaching their younger staff how to do that. So that's one of the first things that I talk about is you need to understand the market. And, and this comes also with the work that I did in communications and public relations, but understand the audience and look at it that way. How are they getting their information? So look at your potential clients. How do they get their information? How do they find you or other architects? What are their biggest obstacles or hurdles or challenges in reaching out to you? Make it easy for them to say yes. So one of my like biggest things that I tell kind of everybody is whatever you're doing, if you need, like make it easy for them to say to say yes, to hire you. So relieve their stress, relieve their, you know, if they are scared to talk to architects, you know, make the phone call. It took a lot of courage for them to reach out to you. Do the courtesy of answering the call and, mm -hmm. and making them feel more comfortable, you know, because I, just in my own experience, I think that uh, the architects that I worked for were kind of not the most friendly when it came to cold calls people you know calling out of the blue looking for someone to help them so yeah that's that's what I do is is I kind of teach how to well choose the projects don't be I mean you can be a generalist architect and you can do everything under the sun any kind of project but what do you want to do and go for those clients and or what do you want to learn and you know do what you know and then do the bulk of your work in what you know and then 
the stuff that you want to learn how to do, just kind of feather it in a little at a time and learn it and then and then add it to your services. Yeah, that's great advice because then you'd be overloaded learning. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And your and your uh, bank account is dependent on you. <laughs> so yeah. You don't need that kind of pressure. So keep the money coming in. And then when you're good to introduce the new service as like a full fledged service, then do it. On the teaching side, what are you teaching as an adjunct professor? Okay, so I'm at my community college and um, we had a, a happy change at our community college. We are architecture students. The number of students doubled this last year. So we had to, they had to go find new teachers and there aren't enough people out here in our community that can teach or are willing to teach. Um, so they reached out to me and asked if I could teach. And so this is my second semester teaching. We just started last night. It was was our first class of the next semester. Um, so I'm still new to teaching. And I tell my students, I am an architect, not a teacher. So be patient because I'm still figuring this out too. So um, I teach hand drawing for first year students. So what we do is kind of more on the art side, hand drawing, isometrics, perspectives, shade and shadow, that kind of stuff. That's what we did first semester. And then second semester, we are learning architectural history and working in hand drawing, recreating um, pieces from the architectural history. We also, and we're doing color. Color is a big part of this semester's course. So um, it's almost like the before we could do renderings in software, we did them by hand. So it's teaching them mm -hmm. how to do it by hand, but also how to do conceptual get the conceptual thoughts out um, on paper, um, which I think is one of the most important skills uh, for architects is to get it out, get it out on paper and make it, you know, make it make sense to you on paper and to the client on paper before you get it in the computer. <laughs> yeah. So if there's one thing that I do want to keep uh, in our industry, it's that pen to paper action. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of programs jump right into programs or they just do diagrams and sketching. Um, I know I still did hand drawings through the end of second year and then we were moving more digital, but, or it was a mix. I think that last semester, like we still had to have a hand chunk hand drawn, which I remember meticulously like draw everything in a pencil. And then I want to go over it with marker and you're worried about messing things up. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's refreshing to hear that you're doing all the hand drawings and going through that because that's one of the things that I got interested in architecture and everybody nowadays, when I see them come out of school, it's just like, okay, you just did the big like rendering stuff. And then who knows what AI did? What did you actually do? What can you create? Um, but I wouldn't discount yourself as you're not a teacher because I don't know really any architecture professor <laughs> that got an education degree i feel I like know. so many studio professors they're just grabbing people from the architecture community around them to teach regardless if it's studio or materials class or computer drafting yeah. like they're pulling around them so it's not like i don't know k through 12 where you go to school to be a teacher to learn how to teach a subject it's very different it's so it's the my students are mostly well, they're they're mostly fresh out of high school, so it's just kind of sharing with them. Hey, I'm not actually like one of your high school teachers. Exactly. I didn't go to school, and I don't do training on how to be a better teacher. <laughs> um, I'm doing my best, just you know. But I I don't know. I like it a lot. It's it's rewarding and it's fun. Um, yeah. So it's it's also kind of hard. My my class is uh, twice a week, and it's four hours each day that it's twice a week. Oh, so it's Four it's like a five. long studio. It's longer than studio. Because usually studio, when I look at remembering my schedule and I have a couple friends that teach, I think it's usually like a three hour, but sometimes it's three days a week. Yeah, it's but, long. That's a lot of, it's a lot of talking. It's a lot of drawing. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a lot. So how are you managing your time between professor, family, running a business. How's that yeah. going? 
check in. So, since uh, since you mentioned that, I also wanted to throw in there. I do run a business. I am an architect, and now I'm teaching, and I have a family. Um, two teenagers, one in college, and one a sophomore in high school. So they have their own full schedules. But um, I've also been a leader in AIA at our state level, and I just finished a two-year term on the executive committee at AIA California as the vice president of the Academy for Emerging Professionals. And that in itself was like, I had at least, I had around 12 meetings a month, which were from an hour to, uh, or I mean, some of them were just whole days. That was almost another job in itself. And I stepped away. <laughs> I didn't run for another leadership position this year because I definitely need a break from it. I've been serving in AIA leadership since I got my license in 2015 consecutively. I was um, elected as the president of our chapter uh, for 2016, which was right after I got my license. We didn't have anyone in our chapter that wanted to be president. And so since I was newly licensed, they said, hey, would you do it? And I said, yeah. And then since then, I've served um, in my own chapter leadership as we have no staff members. So as a volunteer executive director, and um, I did an advocacy position called a champion for uh, better Communities, which is a AIA blueprint for better. I was an advocate, a champion. So I had um, training and was done uh, to be a local advocate um, for more community building and kind of urban planning. And then I was elected to serve as our state representative to the Young Architects Forum uh, for two years and then came on as the vice president of the Academy for Emerging Professionals. So. I feel like that has been a part-time job in itself. <laughs> so, yeah. And even, so I kind of have two questions. So one, the difference between the Academy of Emerging Professionals and the Young Architects Forum for your area, because for my area, it's mainly just the Young Architects Forum, unless I'm missing something with the state, which I definitely could. The other part is the Academy when you spoke about how much time the Academy took and having 12 hours a month, like typical committees, you're maybe meeting once a month and do a few little things. So that's a lot more extensive than a lot of the other committees that I've talked to locally. So why was that more and what was different? So um, our state, our young architects representative for our state, is so they're a participant in YAF in the Young Architects Forum, and, and so the National AIA Committee, mm -hmm. and they are also a member of the Academy for Emerging Professionals at AIA California. So, and that is an advisory committee of ten people in the Academy for Emerging Professionals. We have two student directors, two associate member directors. We have the YAF the the Young Architects representative. We have the NAC representative. So <laughs> if I remember my the wording, because they just changed their yeah. name, states associate representative. And we have a member at large who is a person more experienced as an architect to serve as, as the experience in our committee. And then we have me as the vice president for the Academy of Emerging Professionals. And then we have a staff liaison. So it's a group of 10 plus the staff liaison. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you're a member of YAF for our state as the state rep, then you're also a member of the Academy for Emerging Professionals. Okay. So you also have a position as a board member at our state. So your voice is both um, important at the national level and important at the state level. So our state board has about 60 members. We are the biggest board out of all of the states. Um, and we have, I think half of our Academy for Emerging Professionals advisory committee are um, voting members on our state board. So we think that it's important for emerging professionals to have their voice represented um, at our state level. So, I mean, just like every other state, um, the other the other members on our board are chapter representatives. We have 21 chapters in California. 
So, and then they have at least one member. Some of the bigger chapters like LA and San Francisco have more than one member. So, yeah. Um, so it's a big board. Um, but as, as is with every other state, uh, chapters may not necessarily elect their own um, representative as an emerging professional. So we wanted to make sure that emerging professionals' voices were also on the board. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be. So yeah. And yeah. then, so that's the difference between the Academy for Emerging Professionals and YAF as the position. Yeah. Um, what we do in the Academy in AIA California is we represent the voice of, and we're advocates for the students, the associate members, and the newly licensed members up to 10 years. And we are the connection to the, we want all of the local chapters in California to have uh, emerging professional representatives. So we are their contact to the state. So we have a uh, we have a summit every year, the Academy for Emerging Professionals Summit, every year where we gather the local chapter emerging professional leaders together with us and we share with them what our resources are, who they can reach out to. We have a learning program for them to uh, this next year or this, this year now that it's 2024, we're focusing on EDI. So we want them to be EDI champions in their chapter and in their area. We are also connected to uh, the AIAS chapter leaders in our state, and we are working with them on providing a stronger connection and more listening to them because we want our students to do, to have an, an easier process, um, to have a better curriculum. We advocate for more appropriate curriculums at our schools. Um, we're also working with some community colleges in California, and one of them is the college that I'm working at, to develop four-year bachelor's degree programs in architecture um, at the community college level. And we, we're just, we're at the point where we want more practice management, project management, business um, specifications, the more the practical meat of what we do as yeah. architects taught in the schools and the existing curriculums at the other schools in our state are less willing to make those adjustments. And so we're working with community colleges to develop, the state of California has allowed them to create their own bachelor's degree programs as community colleges, which is fantastic. And so we're working with them on creating curriculum that architecture firms would like uh, new graduates to have, which means they will graduate more valuable, uh, more valuable to firms, more practical knowledge of what's needed in a firm as an employee. And um, I don't know, it's just, it's just giving them the tools that they need to work in the profession. So that's something we're working with. One of the other things that, um, that we did at the Academy for Emerging Professionals is we advocated to add the term Architect in Training, which is AIT in our legislation. So we're introducing that to legislation this year. And we're hoping to have that as a legal term for test takers to use uh, while they're getting their license. So we're making good changes. Yeah. We're moving the profession forward. Yeah, because that's all fantastic. Because I always hated, like, when I was studying, they're like, call yourself an emerging professional. And I'm like, who outside of architecture would even know what I am saying? Like, I can't say I'm an architect. So to say I'm an emerging professional, and that's going to turn into a whole long discussion on what I'm talking about. I know. It's the longest discussion. How do you explain what you do without saying you're an architect or, or yeah. almost an architect? But if you say architect in training, like I either say that or an architectural apprentice, like, you know, if we could just use those terms, then we don't have to go explain ourselves to make people even more confused on what an architect does. Yeah. But And I'm so glad you guys are getting this in the community college level, because it's a lot of the reasons why I started Mentor Dino is trying to fill those gaps that they don't teach you in school. Not only just the specifications i'm working on a course with that to add into it but they don't learn how to draft or to hand draw things anymore so they come into a firm and they don't even know how to dimension properly they don't know 
how things get put together because they're not on construction sites when they're in school. They're not figuring out how to own a firm. They don't know how to work in a giant team if they're getting hired by a bigger firm. They're used to by themselves, maybe one other person, and then build things with giant cantilevers with products that don't exist. So I'm just, I'm super excited you're getting it in the community college level because I know I have people tell me to go teach professional practice. I'm like, well, professional practice is so tiny out of a full bachelor master's program. I did research for um, Build Pittsburgh, our local AIA Pittsburgh conference, and I studied the nearest 25 schools and what their programs were and seeing how much they're the same throughout all of them. And professional practice was 2% of the total five or six year curriculum. And most of them, they don't even learn it until you're in your master's. I'm like, you're going five years without even knowing how the, any sort of business of architecture, but then you get a measly like two hours and that's all you're going to learn. But they want you to go own your own firm and do these things like this seems so out of balance i 100 percent agree yeah and i know what you mentioned you um saw melody's presentation from the beginning even in hers she's like there's not even specifications taught and that's half of the construction documents you have no idea what i'm talking about when i even say the word specifications i so. know i know um i i did uh so back when I was younger in that construction firm that I worked at, that was a design build firm. We were, it was a new company and we were going and we were growing and we were building and just, I mean, go, 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 go. And then the boss said, hey, we need project manuals because now we're working in five different states doing, doing, now we had studios. We had three studios. One was hospitality, which was hotels, and one was medical doing everything except hospitals. And then one was commercial. And I was the commercial studio lead um, at a young age in my 20s, leading leading the team for five states. Um, but they said, we need someone to write specs in our architect. We had two licensed architects on staff, not me. So I was a studio lead, not as a licensed person. Um, but they said... We need specs and Mandy is, I was on maternity leave or something, I think, and wanting to come back into the workplace more slowly. So they gave me a project of writing the master specs. Hey. <laughs> and I didn't know what master specs were and I didn't know, but it was, I needed to write the master specs for our three different studios. So one for medical, one for hospitality and one for commercial, which is kind of everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so that was... Uh, I I was actually really grateful that they gave me that task. I learned so much and they also let me go talk to the contractors. And I learned how to write specs from the contractors and I asked them all of the questions like what quality control like do you guys actually do in the field? What would be if we put this quality control level in the specs, are we asking for too much or should we be asking for more? Or what, you know, what products do you typically use that you can recommend that we, you know, throw in there? You know, things like that. Yeah. When you have I to find know. three manufacturers to right. have options. It's like, yes. well, what ones are the reliable ones? What ones can we have easy access to that aren't a long lead time? Yeah. But we were one team. We were we were builders and designers all in one under one roof. So we needed to work together well. So um so I wrote master specs not knowing anything about specs. I hadn't seen a spec book ever before. I had no idea. So I learned about CSI and jumped right in and wrote master specs. So I mean no. You, you don't understand how to do your plans unless you understand the specs. I yeah. mean, you, I, I can't like, and they have to, you know, like the importance of the specs influence your plans. And if they're not matching up, I mean, I don't know. It's just for, for those who want to do better at their job in architecture, learn how to write specs. Yeah. Cause people oftentimes try to put, so much in the drawing side and you don't need to because other components or details are owned in the spec so you don't 
need to go in excruciating detail within the drawings. You just need to be able to describe what it is so they know where to go in the spec. And the spec has the more fine grained detail. And then it's owned in one spot. So you don't make clashes between drawings and specs or clashes within your own drawings if you changed it in one spot and forgot the other two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But I have heard from contractors that they don't read the specs ever, only they're legally held to them. <laughs> so yeah, that's up to them if they don't want to read them. But yeah. Yeah, I did a small stint at a design build firm and they put all their specs on the drawings and it drove me nuts with editing them if we needed anything. But it's like, OK, I get the point. It's a lot like quality control within an architecture firm. People will go through the drawings, maybe, if there's enough time. I've seen a number of projects where they don't even have time to check every sheet. And so, you know, if they're not checking every sheet of the drawings, that nobody's even opening the specs to check them. And the specs can save your butt on so many things. Or like we used to do before we had uh, project manuals to use. We, We did that. We had our specs as much information as we could without being too limiting to the contractors Mm -hmm. on the plans. But then you have different project managers who are, some are more thorough than others and some really put in the time to make their plans, you know, complete and with really good, valuable information. But if you're doing a restaurant and then you have another PM doing a restaurant and yours have all of these fantastic like specs in your plans and the other guys doesn't then you know like you're you would want say like the next project comes along it's another restaurant and you know how architecture firms work is they grab maybe the most recent project and Mm -hmm. and start from there like as a template and move forward and just adjust the design as needed but they keep all the words and the notes and everything if you grabbed the wrong one (laughs) yeah you know you might want to grab the right one but if it's just a project manual then you're you're golden yeah and especially if they're using that for training i know i like training and showing people through an example set but i always try to let them know like review the set with a fine tooth comb something may not be perfect always question something something may not be complete but don't just assume that it's perfect because there is no perfect drawing set but if it's you grab the wrong spec set like People don't even know what a spec is, what's in it. It can be hard to catch if it's a good one or a bad one. Mm-hmm. So, um, but adjusting a little bit, I wanted to talk about um, the Parents and Architecture Facebook group. I know you're one of the founding um, members or organizers, whatever you want to call it. Can you tell me a little bit about what started that group? I would love to. Um this this one's this one's important to me as a parent in architecture and my kids like i said before are older now they i have a sophomore and a freshman in college um when i when they were younger and when i was working in the profession you weren't supposed to talk about being a parent and there weren't very many women working in architecture anyway um just very very few anyway so you couldn't it was wrong for you to expect time off if your child was sick or all of the doctor appointments that children have. I mean, they just really have to go to the doctor all the time. Shots all the time, checkups all the time. Um, And it, you know, sometimes falls on, it falls on either parent, but for me, it fell on me to to do those things. Um, But I wasn't supposed to ask for it and I wasn't supposed to expect the time off and I wasn't supposed to talk about it. And I wasn't supposed to like if my child won an award in like second grade, I, you know, couldn't attend the awards assembly because asking for that time off was working in a office with just, you know, explaining the, the context of where I was working. It was all men and they had their wives taking care of the kids stuff and they preferred. And I was told, you know, pretty straight out that they preferred for their wives to be stay at home moms and that they were the providers and that Mandy shouldn't get time off to go blah, blah, you know, do the things that the mom needs to do because if she wants to be the mom, she should not work kind of stuff. And it was hard. It was really hard. And I didn't, 
I accepted it, but it was, it was not okay. It wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons that when I got my license, I said, you know, I'm going to set my own schedule. I'm going to, I'm going to work from home. I'm going to, or I did have an office outside of the house, but I made my own hours. Um, I definitely made time for my kids as they were growing up, but I got my license as soon as I could and, and started my firm so that I could make the call. So I could mm -hmm. make my schedule so I could give them that time. So the way that the parents and architecture group worked is that um, I feel like I was one of the people that, that, that wanted to speak out for this. Um, and my friend, Michael Resica was putting together his first in-person conference, the Young Architect Conference in Portland, Oregon. And he asked me to be a speaker for, first it was for mothers in architecture. And then he thought that's kind of limiting. And so he opened it to parents in architecture. So he provided a place for me to talk about being a parent in architecture to this group of people who were on, who were younger than me in, in, they were in the process of getting their license, you know, some of them newly married, some of them starting their families, some of them with just a couple, you know, young kids still learning how to navigate working and parent, how to balance it all. Um, these were men and women. They, they all attended. Um, so we just made it an open conversation and uh, two of the attendees there were also the co-founders of our Parents and Architecture group on Facebook. So there was already an existing Facebook group for mothers in architecture. And during that, that uh, discussion in Portland at the Young Architect Conference, we felt that the dads also needed to have a place. <laughs> the yep. dads were doing work and they wanted they you know and it wasn't so much that you know the environment that I worked in was more that they wanted their wives to take care of that stuff but that wasn't the case across the board that was definitely not to be assumed that dads didn't want to take their kids to the dentist or to baseball practice in the middle of the day or you know whatever whatever it was that the dads wanted their time too mm -hmm. so we um my friends Brian Pinchow and Gloria Cloder started the Parents and Architecture Group. So when we started, I had the two older kids. Brian had two young girls and Gloria didn't have any babies yet. So she came in as, as wanting to know how to start the process of starting the family. So I thought the three voices of us together were important. It balanced the group pretty well and it definitely gave... Uh, having Brian in there as one of the founders was, was important to have the dad's point of view too. Yeah. Cause it does for most families, it's a balance between if something happens with the kid, like you, most places don't have unlimited PTO if you do need to take time off for any reason. So you can't rely on just one parent or if you are at a job site, maybe your husband has to go pick up the kid from school that day or, um, different instances like that. But I've also a number of friends that decide to go on their own, either right before starting to have a family or right after for that flexibility of being able to manage their schedule and not being stuck to a eight hours a day, your butt's in your seat from this time to this time. And you get two weeks of PTO and that's all you get for the year. Yeah. Yeah. But that PTO as a as a parent of young kids, that PTO goes to them, mm -hmm. like it, like the doctors and that just the, everything that I said. It doesn't go to you. So if you need time off for yourself, like you've got Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, and I've noticed I am not a parent, but I have noticed with a lot of uh, my friends and coworkers that have young kids that COVID really changed a lot of things. Not only being able to work from home, but just the lack of flexibility that's come up in the childcare system. If COVID goes around in your classroom, everybody goes home. Uh, your kid has to test negative before they can come back. God forbid they sneeze, then they can't come home. But pre COVID, I remember moms I worked with, like I dope my kid up with as much medicine as possible and we'll see how long they last. Yeah. And you can't like, there's not that much flexibility or even pickup time. I hear is was more flexible in the beginning 
or pre-COVID, I should say, and now post-COVID, it's nope, you have to be here by this time. And that time is usually when you're supposed to be working till. So Mm -hmm. it's almost less flexible from the daycare education side that yeah yeah have have you noticed conversations shifting in that group since covid um or is it the same the same questions and concerns it was um during during the pandemic when everything closed it was a lot of so my sister is um she has six kids she's a photographer she owns her own business um when the pandemic started I reached out to my sister and um, she homeschools her six children and has a whole homeschool community. So when the pandemic hit, some of us that were parents that had children had to learn how to be a homeschool teacher as well as working in the profession from home for the first time, you know, trying to navigate uh, the working thing and then also the teaching child thing because we're not Necessi- we're parents, but we're not necessarily teachers, and it's mm-hmm. it's kind of a different avenue, right? Um, so I asked my sister if she could offer resources or teach us how to navigate this, and so she stepped into the Parents and Architecture Facebook group to to be that resource for our parents trying to figure out how to teach our kids um, during that time when they couldn't go to school. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. Yeah. Um, Because I know there's even new content creators that came out that were teachers just wanting to help teach different types of topics and lessons when everybody was at home. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'll just put a plug out that the Parents of Architecture group is for parents and non-parents. I know I'm on there. I do not have any kids, but it's good to be part of the conversation just to see what's going on because I don't know what's going to happen in my future. So. Right. Um, Helps me give perspective and see what questions are out there, what questions I may have, or just trying to have some empathy. Yeah. Yeah. And be a supporter. It's, um, it's really helpful to be a supporter of your colleagues or like, you know, fellow staff members, or if you get to a position where you're a leader in your firm, um, having the empathy, maybe if you don't have kids, but learning, learning what the challenges are for those who do, um, can help you be a better leader too. Yeah. And give that understanding when you were afraid to take time off or didn't feel comfortable seeing how celebrating your kids or taking time off for that. So, yeah. And then I like wrapping up all of my podcasts with this final question. And it's what advice do you have for young professionals just starting their career? So when you say starting their career, do you mean finishing school, starting their career? Or I usually leave it open ended, but most people are taking it from first job, end of education. Okay. So, so one of the things, so I did mention that I am an adjunct instructor at a community college teaching architecture. One of the things that I think is the most important thing for my students and for the young people in architecture is don't stop. Just, just don't stop keep going. You are going to face challenges. Um, I am as transparent as I can be about what those challenges are in reality. Real life isn't school. Real life, um, there are challenges with people who have um, biases or prejudices, or they prefer certain people of certain cultures to work in their firms, or certain genders, or, you know, any of those things that it is subjective when you get hired to work in a firm. So just kind of expect a little bit of challenges in finding the right firm that's a good fit for you. But really, it's don't stop. And I think that that came from a few years ago when I was younger in the profession. Uh, There were less women um, in the profession. There still aren't. I mean, we're growing, we're a growing number and we're hugely supportive of each other. But um, one of the key components of of women not being in the profession is that they stop after college and they either don't get hired into firms in the first place. They just can't even get in the door or they get in the door and they're put in a position that they're not where they're not given enough room to grow or to succeed or they are sometimes pushed out of 
the workplace and not welcome as as a participant in the architecture community. So it it does happen, but one of the things that I mean it happened to me, it happened to several women, you know, that I I, I can't say that it's happened to every woman because I'm really hoping that we it's getting better. Yeah. But um being pushed out don't don't stop. And so like one of the things that I tell everyone you know, younger in the profession is keep going, <laughs> keep going, because the doors might close on you and you might have to pivot, but that's normal. And sometimes you get to choose to pivot. Sometimes the work environment that you're in isn't the right fit for you and you get to choose to leave to go work for another one. So it's not always the case that, you know, the workplace shuts you out, but you can also have that power to shut them out as well. Mm -hmm. But don't stop. Like, pick your goal, reach your goal, and pick a new goal. Yeah, and it goes back to, like, the culture that you dealt with, that you left. That does not mean every firm and every employer has that culture and mentality. And I feel like a lot of young professionals, when they hit those type of challenges, they just assume all of architecture is like that. And they don't try out another firm or try to find something that fits them better. They just stop and give yeah. up and that's just one of the points so that's yeah. fantastic advice thank you that's I think that's one of the that's one of the connections that we need to have a, a bigger broader more diverse culture um, of professionals in architecture I, I feel it's not just like gender-based it's not just women but it's also sexual orientation based it's also you know race ethnicity culture based it's it's all of it and i feel like the doors tend to shut on people that are different than you know the than what the firm owner prefers to work with i guess is the easy way to say it um it is preference the, the mm -hmm. people hiring get to choose who works there and but um you know you also get to choose where you work exactly so, it's yeah it's not as direct and decisive whenever people get promoted to different positions and do different things it is very subjective in that process so it is yeah but it's now, not just architecture that's the same it's I mean, everywhere it's, it's everywhere so i mean we're not bad mouthing this profession at all it is just kind of the world that we live in yeah and don't let one closed door close you all down that just means there's other doors you may have not seen yet Yes. And the alternative paths in the architecture, if you wanted to, instead of be a licensed architect, choose to be like a spec writer, choose to be an owner's rep, choose to be a professor in college instead, choose to work for an amusement park um, in designing, you know, doing their accessibility, you know, making sure that the park is accessible. Just there's so many different avenues that you can take in architecture uh the firm a traditional firm culture is not the only path yep there's so many different options which is what i love about this podcast is just talking to so many people doing different things with very similar educations so now if anybody want would want to get a hold of you or have questions is there a good way to get a hold of you um linkedin is probably the best way so my linkedin handle is my name mandy freeland um just find the yep. picture that looks like me <laughs> <laughs> i'll leave a link That's down below to make it super easy for everybody and i'll try to find links for the academy of emerging professionals grab a link from the parents in architecture group so i will grab all that and put it down below so it's easy access for everybody to go check out everything we talked about today thank so. you thank you for having me this yeah. was fun and thank good you luck so with much Mandy. you're doing yeah for sure oh thank you i know i'm always running around doing different things. So I'm sure you can understand. <laughs> yeah, I, a little bit. Yep. Lots <laughs> That's of what juggling. Makes, like, this is what makes things better. Yeah, like, it's always the fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And this is just amazing and just meeting people across the country. So I am having a blast. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. Check out the description below for any resources, links, and contact information we discussed. Did you like the conversation today? Is there something you'd like to know more about or a topic I should cover? Leave me a comment below and I will see what I can do to best answer your questions. 
And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel. It does really help others be able to find this resource to have larger conversations. So leave me a comment and subscribe. I really appreciate your support.